Welcome okay. everyone. Okay, yeah. Welcome everyone to this webinar. Um, this is one of two webinars we're doing. One we did yesterday where we interviewed Joanne Levan, who is the leader of the Conservative Opposition in Enfield Council. And today I'm really pleased that we've got Nezel Kalifban, who is um, the leader of Enfield Council and has recently become the leader. And I'm pleased that she's agreed to do this interview because it's fantastic to do interviews of, of leading politicians locally and to find out what they're thinking. So let, let's start. But let me say to you before we start, if you want to ask questions, as I said before, we type them into the, the webinar, webinar Zoom chat box, or if you're on Facebook, chat it into the, uh, type it into the comments section, and we'll try and pick it up if we can. Okay, well, Nez, thank you very much for doing this. And um, I think what people will be interested in to start with, is tell us something about your background. What actually brought you into politics? Really, I got involved in the Labour Party through community campaigning. So some of the issues that I campaigned about in Enfield was uh, trying to save the um, hospital, and the closure of Chase Arm Hospital, you'll remember, was, a, was something we fought hard against. So um, it was really community campaigning that got me involved in local politics. And then I was fortunate enough to go off to university and, you know, led some national campaigns against the increase in tuition fees. But it was really local politics that got me involved. Um, and more recently, uh, my absolutely belief in local government and councils being able to provide us Sort of transformative change that's necessary. Okay, well you're, you're obviously a very active and energetic person because I could tell how you messed around with the technology there, you did really well. So, <laughs> you know, if, 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 you, if you got that energy, you decided at some point you wanted to be leader of the council and you decided that at the last minute, didn't you? What made you do it? What made you do it at the last minute? Well, I mean, there's, a, there's an annual general meeting that happens every year to elect the cabinet and there is also an, an, a, a meeting uh, that takes place at the beginning of every term of a new administration in Labour Group and people put themselves forward but you know the reason that I ran for leader of the council to be the leader of Labour Group is very much the same reason that I decided to get involved in Labour politics in the first place and the same reasons I decided to run for as a councillor in 2015 when I ran in a by-election because I believe in local government because I think um, I'm ready to make a contribution now because I don't think your age your background your gender or your ethnicity should be a barrier to being able to say that I can make that contribution and because I think Labour values are the right ones to be able to deliver for the people of Enfield and the services that we want to press ahead with at the council. So it's a combination of all of those things um, and I was delighted to, to be elected. And I also think it's a crucial time for both the council and the borough and to be able to build on the successes of the previous administration and to take us forward. Um, I thought it was an opportunity to be able to provide a fresh leadership and to build on the successes and also drive forward some some changes during what is a really difficult time for local government. But you, you decided to stand at the last minute. Was that sort of an impetuous decision at the end or had you planned this for some time? Well, standing, so we have the local elections um, and then there, there's a, a few weeks before we have our AGM uh, as a Labour group. And before then, it's absolutely right that everyone focuses on being able to campaign and support colleagues and be elected. But um, I mean, that election happens every four years so uh everyone knows the election is going to happen and certainly you know when i was thinking about my you know what after the election after we'd won and we'd had an absolutely fantastic success across the borough where people had said we want labor councillors representing us and we've won four, 46 seats you know then there is a two-week period where people think about what contribution can i make to the labor administration and like i said i thought it was the right time for me personally but also I think the right time for the council too. So, okay, you, you came in as Labour leader and suddenly you found yourself in this unique position of having two women leaders, leader of the opposition and leader of the council. Now, some people say that when you have leaders who are women, it brings a new style of politics. You know, men are aggressive, adversarial, they can bully, they can intimidate, and women are, are meant to be much more 
you know, deliberative. They, they believe in teamwork. They like their team to go out and engage with the community, whoever they are. Do you think you bring this feminine style of leadership to the council or what style do you bring? I mean, I stood to be the leader of Enfield Council uh, as the Labour leader of Enfield Council. And I stood because I didn't think that my gender, my ethnicity or my age should be a barrier. Um, but I stood as a Labour leader and that is the distinctive characteristic that I think I offer compared to other political parties. Now, am I proud that I'm the first woman leader of Enfield Council? Yes. Am I proud that I'm the first BME woman council leader in the country? Of course I am. But I stood because I, I, I believed in Labour values and some of the things that we will deliver as administration. But I mean, I think, I think you make a good point. I think there has been a lot of discussion about the fact that we have two female leaders at Enfield Council. Um, uh, we've had two men leaders of the political parties for an awfully long time, and that was of no discussion, I don't remember. Um, but certainly I know over the last few weeks when people have spoken about my age, what I know that what they're really speaking about is my gender. Because, you know, I'm almost certain if I was a 20, I would be described as ambitious. Um, but as a 29 year old female, other uh, uh, descriptions have been uh, used to describe um, what I think is uh, my commitment to the council. Well, I was thinking really this style because I was brought up in 1960s sort of feminism, Germaine Greer and all that, where women were meant to have a much more softer approach to power. They weren't bullying, they weren't intimidating, they actually involved people. And I'm just wondering if that's what the new council is going to be with you and Joanne. I can't speak for the Conservatives, but I don't think their conduct over the last few weeks has demonstrated compassion or kindness. Um, the council under my leadership will look to reduce inequality because it has grown in the borough. The council under my leadership will build on the good work of the previous administration and make sure that we deliver Meridian Water. The council under my leadership will talk about partnership working so that we can tackle the 17% increase in youth violence over the next you know, coming years so that we can tackle that dramatic increase. So they're the things that we'll be doing as a council. Um, I don't think my gender is a hindrance, um, but equally, I think the other characteristics and leadership skills that I can provide are the things at the forefront um, of, my, of, of my years ahead. No, well, I wasn't saying your gender was a hindrance. I was saying it could be a very positive change in that deliberative, open, transparent approach. But let, let's, let's look at some, some issues. But let, before we do that, let's look at the Conservative opposition. They've had a rather bad week, haven't they, where they've had to suspend one councillor um, because of inappropriate remarks. Do you think Joanne LeBan acted very quickly on that and she should be congratulated? Well, let's be absolutely clear. The remarks were not unfortunate. They were racist and this is the second in uh, instances over the last couple of weeks it's the second individual that's had to be suspended you know lead those in positions of leadership and, and responsibility have a responsibility to call out racism whether it's happening in their own political party or another political party and i just want to take a moment to talk about full council because we've People have spoken about that moment where somebody got up and was incredibly racist to one of my Labour councillors. But I just want to talk about the couple of minutes before that, because what was happening was a motion had been tabled by one of our youngest and brightest, if she doesn't mind me saying, new councillors. Somebody that was born and brought up in London and lives in Enfield and went to Enfield schools. And she comes from a BME background but her motion was about cuts to our schools, was about the deep cuts that the schools were experiencing and the impact that was having, both in terms of the quality of education they were able to provide and also class sizes. And she was saying that austerity was having an impact and given we're about to start a new term, a new school term, she wanted to draw attention to that. And it was a fantastic speech, it was her maiden speech, um, and having delivered a maiden speech, I know that's quite nerve wracking, but you often pick a topic that's deeply important to you. And I know that it was really, really important to her. And we often have great debates in the chamber, speeches that are brilliant from both, both political parties. And she sat down and I thought it was going to be a good debate. 
And what followed not only didn't address the issues that she spoke about, but it was a direct attack on her and the community that she came from. And as you might imagine, it totally erupted. Now, was what happened afterwards quick enough? Uh, I was pleased that that individual didn't return to the chamber, but I understand he was advised not to by council officers. He should have been suspended immediately. And the actions, you know, Councillor Laban didn't suspend him. It was the National Party that suspended him. But time will tell. And I do hope that the Conservative Party don't reward such behaviour by reinstating him as a Conservative member of the council. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 yes, she did suspend within 24 hours, and that's good. And I, lots of Labour people have complimented her on that. Um, and everyone should stand against racism. You're absolutely right. And Susan, who did the speech, of course, I mean, she actually sent us a motion and we put it on them for voices. And she's going to do the debate again, I know. And she's going to send the speech to us, so we'll put it on site because I mean, it, it was. Like in the suspension immediately that evening. Yeah, well, yeah, uh, but, but the, the suspensions happen now and, and, and that's a good thing. And I think everyone could go together and say that was wrong, that, that the racism was wrong. And I think we all agree about that. But what it shows is something about councillors and the quality of councillors and the selection of councillors. Conservative Party clearly has had some problem about their councillors, but you've had problems about selection as well. You know, the National Executive Executive Committee is looking in the process of selection that happened in Enfield and I don't want to go into that because they're doing that but what I want to ask you is you know there are questions about selection aren't they when you've got um, selection in safe seats which tantamounts to election in, in, in reality then you know uh, ward meetings, selection meetings can be hacked by people when there's small attendance or small memberships, it can be taken over. Somehow we've got to bring selection up to be more dem democratic, more into the 21st century, more open, more transparent, involve more people. How can we do that? Because we, you know, what we've gone through, Conservatives and you, is not good enough, is it? Okay, so firstly, uh, what the General Secretary of the Labour Party has been very clear on, because she's emailed me and also members directly, is that the investigation that has been referred to is not into the selections. The Labour Party has been very clear there was an open, fair and transparent process of the selections in Enfield. What is being looked at is the many, many complaints that members have submitted about, unfortunately, the racism that they have experienced over the last few weeks. And that racism has been acute and uncomfortable and unfair. Let me talk about the selection process for Labour councillors. We have a local campaign forum um, that oversees the selection process. Um, and actually, ultimately, it's overseen by the uh, regional Labour Party. All of our candidates are actually interviewed, not by local people, but by people that the regional body selects so we don't have that personal connection to the people that we're interviewing. I understand that the Conservative Party have quite a different process and, and they do interview local people um, and I think uh, it's far better the way that we do it and have the regional body interview it. And when it comes to selections themselves, and again I'm not familiar with the Conservative Party process, but I understand that they don't necessarily do the shortlisting through membership voting. I'm really proud of the Labour Party. We do think things absolutely democratically, both from the shortlisting all the way through to selection. Our members turn up to each ward and they quiz and they are hard fought and they are competitive and so they should be. It is an absolute privilege to get to stand as a Labour candidate. So, so are you saying, yeah, are you saying it's, that it's good um, enough at the moment or, or would you improve it? Because, you know, I, I don't want to go into the blame game or an analysis. Just want to say, is there is any way you can improve it? This is how I would improve it. I would have more members in the Labour Party and we've been incredibly lucky over the last few years. Our membership has just shot up and we need the way to get better representation, uh, even more diverse representation is to make sure that we have lots of people involved in grassroots politics, that we support women who want to come through, that we support those of BME backgrounds, that we support those who have, you know, are of a, who have different opinions to us so that we have vibrant party politics locally. That's how you do it. You don't do it, I'm afraid, by supporting racist undertones, supporting racist journalists, 
or by attacking those who have decided to be brave enough, who come from BME backgrounds to put themselves up for leadership positions. I think it's great that so many people have come from BME backgrounds and, and, and I think that, uh, you know, we'll see a lot more of that and they get much more involved and that's good. But I think, you know, the selection issue is something that I think will go on and on and on. And I think people nationally are looking at selection and seeing how it can change, not just in Enfield. It is a national problem. But let's go on to your, you know, just, your just, Because I think, I think you make a good point about selections, but for me, selections must be democratic and our membership must choose. So actually the fact that our members in each branch shortlist members and then select the members is far better than what other political parties do, which is sit around a kitchen table and pick the people they want and put them in seats. For me, that's wrong and it doesn't reflect what a political party, at least a Labour political party should be about. So I'm really proud of the membership that we've got in Enfield and that people put themselves forward and got selected by members to stand. Yeah, so you're right. It has to be democratic. It has, also has to be open and transparent. And I think if we can all move towards, well, I'm not. I'm not saying it isn't. Well, I'm just saying we can all we must make sure all of us move towards that because uh, that's very important. But let's go on to some of your priorities as a council leader because that's quite important. When you got selected, when you became leader, you hit the ground running and you came out with your priorities. Do you want to tell us what your priorities are? I'm not going into detail, but just tell us what your priorities are. Um, so I spoke about three in a nutshell, and of course we have lots, um, but three that are immediate priorities was around tackling the increase in youth violence and over the last few months we've had real attention on, on that and you know people are really concerned about that increase. We've had a 17% increase in youth violence in Enfield. The average across London is 8%. My second area of focus was around housing. That will be of no surprise to anybody, but both long-term strategic projects, getting them back on track like Meridian Water, but also the bread and butter, like our repair service, making sure that those in our existing estates are getting the repairs that they need for our property quickly. And the third area of work, and this sort of speaks to um, the challenges that are faced by local government at the moment generally, is around equality. Uh, and reducing the inequality that exists in our borough. So we've already committed to setting up a poverty and equality commission and we're at the early stages of scoping that out and what that might look like. But I'm very clear, we don't, it, it's not a think tank we're creating. It must have a start and finish date. And although it would be wonderful to have the resources to be able to come up with some very complicated policy, something that will really tackle poverty, we, as long as we don't have a Labour government, unfortunately, that will be too difficult to do. And so I want some very two or three very clear recommendations, perhaps four or five, that we can implement as a council so that we can reduce the inequality in our borough. So why did you choose those and leave out things like sustainability and education, for example? Well, I didn't, I didn't leave them out. And actually, our Labour manifesto, Enfield manifesto, articulates those very, very well, actually. We're absolutely committed to sustainability. And it's included in the Enfield Council uh, corporate plan, which was agreed just a few weeks ago. But, you know, often people want to hear about your three top immediate priorities, and they were it. But if you take Meridian Water, for example, we have to make sure that, that those developments are sustainable and the future of things like energetic and our commitment to them, too. Sustainability uh, is not something that can just happen on its own in a little box. We have to embed it into everything we do as a council, equally the same with public health. Well, we'll come on to that in a minute because those are really interesting things. But, you know, one of the problems you've got is, is you know, the, the local government chronicle has said Enfield has, had, has the biggest, fifth biggest overspend for a local authority in 2018-19 with an overspend of something like just over £9 million. And you have said yourself that you want to ring fence, I think you said this at the forum in your, in your ward, you want to ring fence care and, and child services, and you're hoping to make savings through looking, at reassessing outsourcing and management. Now, if you can't make savings on that, because that's going to be really difficult, and you've got to save 20 million pounds in the next year, and you're going to ring fence some services, what are the services that will suffer? What are the services that are going to cut? Because you can't have everything in a time of retrenchment. And you must have thought about that and made some decision on that. 
So I don't think I've ever used the term ring fence, but what I think I would have said, because I absolutely believe is that we must protect the most vulnerable in our communities. And for me, there are two areas that are very, that very clearly um, uh, um, look after our most vulnerable. That is children's services and adult social care. And I don't apologise for saying that we must look after those areas. We must look after our most vulnerable. There, those are two areas um, of spend that are demand led. So yes, we're overspent in both areas because the demand is just so high. And it's worth mentioning, of course, we're not unusual when you speak to the local government association and in fact, um, most other local authorities around the country, they too are overspent um, in both of those departments. And it's interesting the last few weeks because you know we often talk about adult social care and we know just what a difficult time the NHS and adult social care departments are experiencing. But children's services have been less spoken about, but under equal pressure. And so we must protect, and their demand said led services, we must protect those services as much as we can. But in, what, what ones will suffer about, the cuts? What ones will suffer the cuts if you can't get your savings through looking at outsourcing again and through management changes? I mean, you must have decided somehow along the line that if you've got this tight budget, something has to give. And something will have to give, I'm afraid. Over the next couple of months, we have to find £20 million for the first, first tranche of savings. We've lost 60% of our budgets over the last couple of years from central government. So we have got to be honest and we have got to expose what austerity is doing to local government. And that means some really difficult decisions. You are absolutely right to say, well, what's got to give? Now, given what I've said about making sure we protect our most vulnerable, then that means every other service in the local authority has to be looked at. We will have to look at every department where we can find those savings. What I'm keen not to do, however, is do a salami slice approach. So we will fundamentally have to look at our environment department. We will have to look at what kind of service that we provide and what the packages are for our schools. But equally, equally, and we must talk about income generation through commercialising some of what we do as a council. So can I just give you one example? Yeah, go ahead. So, um, and when we commercialise things, I'm very clear with officers and our Labour group is very clear. It's not just about income generation alone. We have to talk about the added social value. So we know the quality of housing in some of our private sector uh, housing in Enfield is pretty bad. And we know because many, many people on a daily basis turn up to John Wilkes house and say, I'm homeless, I need some help. It's their most vulnerable point. You know, they have children, they don't have a roof over their head. We also know that we have some really bad landlords, but we also know that we have some pretty good landlords too. And so wouldn't it be great if we set up our own Enfield Council estate agent, just a bog standard estate agent, so that if you're a responsible, if you're a responsible landlord, you can opt in to the estate agent. We'll charge you for that because you get charged by every other estate agent to do that. You can opt in once you've got our accreditation to say, this house is decent. It doesn't have any mold on the walls. We'll charge you for the service of finding you a tenant. And then we'll say to those who need a house before they're homeless, use our trusted brand, come to Enfield Council estate agent so that we can home you in a house that we have accredited. And that will be some income generation for us, but equally it will also have a real social value because we are, we are trying to improve the quality of housing in the borough. I think that would be a great idea if you could do it, but I know that Ahmed Oitner in his 2012-2017 strategic plan for housing wanted to try and get a, a sort of a, a list of landlords. He wanted a, a sort of an approved list to the local authority. So he was going down the sort of direction that you're going, that you're taking it further, but he ran into difficulty in the courts. So have you looked at how some of your great aspirations will land in reality in terms of what the law will let you do so setting up an estate agent company is absolutely within our gift there's nothing stopping us doing that what um councillor oakner was looking at was around landlords licensing and we were very you know we were one of the first to look at that and you're absolutely right we ran into some difficulty um and there is still scope to look 
a landlord's licensing. But actually, before we do that, before we look at whether that's viable or not, there are some things that we can do around, you know, in the short term with setting up an estate agent. Um, because we have to do something quickly to improve the quality of housing in the borough. But of course, there's been some great success in the previous administration. You'll be familiar with Gateway, uh, Housing Gateway, which looked to, which has bought 500 properties of ex-local authority properties um, that has saved the authority £3 million over the last couple of years. So, I mean, housing is a very good example of an area of challenge that won't have a magic pill, a one uh, one solution that will solve it all. We will have to do different things. But of course, underlying everything is supply. Yeah, um, if, you ever, if underlying everything is supply, what about supplying more housing? What about more council housing in the old fashioned sense or social housing as we call it now? And how can we provide that housing at an affordable rent that is actually affordable and not defined by some government as official as not being affordable? Yeah, because what does really affordable really mean and by whose definition and who can buy it and who can rent it. And often we talk about affordable in terms of being able to buy it, but actually people also challenged in being able to afford their rent. So um, we have a housing strategy that will be developed over the next few months. And I think we'll probably be ready with that in April. Between now and then, the cabinet and I are working hard and our cabinet member, um, uh, Dino Lemonidis is working to explore possible projects and pilots so that it can feed in to our housing strategy. And we're quite clear, we need some short term things that we can do, like for example, building additional floors on flat topped roof buildings that we have and we've had great success doing that over the last couple of months and we put through a report to cabinet that seeks to identify other examples like that in the borough that we can add to so that will help increase the supply uh, of housing but they're relatively uh, small numbers but it's better than nothing and then of course we have big long-term projects like Meridian Water and one of the reasons uh, I talk about Meridian Water is my commitment to speed up the delivery and now that we have fundamentally changed the approach to it from one master developer to a site by site approach it means that we can for example as we have done this week go out to the sector and say we've got planning permission for a site for 750 homes and a second site for 200 homes and Inci we do in incidentally you, you say you've got a new approach but some of the labor councillors involved in what you might call the old approach are saying it's not new actually they had a strategy which had a plan a and a plan b and they went for the plan a because it, they thought it would be more cost effective but if it didn't work they had a plan b and what you've done is you've just gone for their plan b or have you added anything to it so uh, there were a number of years ago that the master developer approach was uh, adopted and it was the right thing to do at the time because the commitment of the previous administration as with now is that we must increase the supply of housing so we just have to be clear about what the master developer approach is so over the last couple of years the local authority has acquired i believe uh, 350 million pounds worth of land we've assembled that land together and that was the right thing to do because it means that we have overall control of that area and then the decision was made to hand over to in, enter a procurement process with bidders where we could hand over that land to one developer. And as you know, the first bid um, was not a success. And when I became leader, there were during negotiations with the second bidder. The first thing I'd say is there's a reason the second bidder is always a second bidder. So um, it was of no surprise to me when we began to look at finances that it wasn't, uh, it wasn't something that I or the rest of Cabinet felt was in the best interest for Enfield people. But there are other things that were concerning too about a master developer. Firstly, that you don't have control over what is a long period of time. We're talking about a 20 year project. And being able to have control of site by site is far better to be able to influence things like the affordability that you've just spoken about. But also, you know, and I always give this example, in the final days before we made it absolutely clear that PCPD was not for us, it was not a marriage that was going to work, is when the cabinet and I invited PCPD to come and present to us. And there were two questions that I thought were, was very telling. And I was concerned that the dialogue had continued as far 
skills it had, given what their answer was. Firstly, I asked them about skills and employment, because Meridian Water was never just about building homes. It was about transforming the life chances of people in Edmonton. And the answer was, there'll be loads of, there will be loads of jobs, because the people that will buy the expensive townhouses will need gardeners and hairdressers. I didn't think that answer really uh, was fitting with the vision and aspiration that we had for Meridian Water. And when one of my cabinet colleagues asked, how will you market these houses? The answer was this. Well, 18 months before completion, we will advertise the houses locally for a month. The second month we will advertise nationally. And the third month we will advertise to the rest of the world. And quite honestly, I'm not willing to risk overseas scales on that sales on that scale which is why that marriage wasn't for us um, and we made the decision as a cabinet to move to a site-by-site -site approach and as a local authority to take the role of the master developer okay so in a way that was an extension on the plan b i guess which is which is a good way to go by the way i mean i was going to ask a lot about meridian waters but we won't go into that because we don't have time but someone actually has asked um you know about the green belt i guess meridian waters and so on is your policy to really look at building on brown sites you're not going to go into the green belt are you well meridian water is is, is brown sites and we've spent a lot of money on remuneration so cleaning clean it, it up um, and I mean on the green belt it's very interesting we have um, odd sites around the around the borough that are sort of boarded up um, sites that look as though they're industrial and then when we look at the designation they're actually green belt so I've asked officers to really look at those small sites to make sure that we are utilizing areas as much as possible okay um, you, you also mentioned Energetic, which is a fantastic scheme, which was developed under the previous regi regime. And we actually interviewed the officer about that, who was incredibly passionate about it. And he was really good. We did that a couple of years ago. Um, and, you know, it looks at, you know, you, you, you involve in Meridian the saving of the carbon footprint, which is important. We had a question coming in about saving your carbon footprint. You probably know that there is a campaign in Enfield to de-invest from fossil fuels. You actually invest in Enfield 60 million pounds in fossil fuels. Do you have a plan to de-invest from that and put that investment into ethical investment? Well, interestingly, uh, my colleague, uh, Mr. Doug Taylor, who chairs the pension fund, is doing some good work at the moment to look at what our investment approach might be as a local authority. And I think that is most welcome. Um, and he will be spending some time over the coming months to look at making sure what our guidance is for investment, um, where our red lines might be. Um, and, I'm, and, I'm, and I know that he'll be looking at that also. So but absolutely, I think it's a campaign that is really important. Uh, and I'm really glad that people are emailing us about it. And it, certainly if it's on everyone's radar, then that means the campaign is doing a good job. Um, but we have to make sure that every aspect of what we do in terms of investment, including pensions at the local authority, we have some very clear guidelines um, that, are, that are driven by our principles and our values and our commitment to carbon footprint um, and reducing that uh, is, is, is very strong. Okay, well, I'm sure the campaign will look very um, intently at the outcome of, of what Doug is doing and what the council is doing on that. Um, one of the things about housing was that I know that in this, the old strategic plan, they were trying to personalise housing, trying to make housing more human to fit, you know, what people wanted uh, uh, for housing and putting them in the housing they wanted rather than a tick box approach. And that's a sort of public health approach to housing as well. Um, and the public health approach is now becoming really strong in the whole area of community safety, community care, social care, and so on. Um, and, you know, I, I know that in terms of community safety, for example, you've done a lot of work. You put £100,000 into youth work and in your press release, you said it was successful. But in a way, it was a one off. And I think what people want to know is whether you've got a strategy on that. I know your cabinet lead on community cohesion, uh, Nika Kiza, recently went to Glasgow to look at the model there that's been successful. What did you learn from that? So um, there, there is some 
incredible work that's happening, I think, in different corners. And one of the challenges for local authorities and indeed the Metropolitan Police is being able to take some of that learning and apply it to itself. So I don't think anybody's falling, foolish enough to think that you can just take a model from elsewhere and apply it to Enfield. It has to absolutely work with Enfield. So um, I'm, I'm, thank you for highlighting the fact that we uh, invested very quickly uh, after May, just before the summer holidays, in fact, the £100,000 into youth activities. We're very honest. We don't think that £100,000 is going to address the increase in youth, serious youth violence. But it was important that we did that ahead of the summer holidays. At the same time, we've put a bid into the mayor's office for half a million pounds because, you know, 95% of funding into youth activities that used to exist no longer exists in Enfield. And that's huge. And quite honestly, I don't think the increase in youth violent crime is a coincidence. Equally, the loss of 400 police officers absolutely matter. So we also had a big public meeting a few months ago. Yes, about six weeks ago, seven weeks ago now to talk about this issue. And the room was absolutely packed. So you knew, I mean, we knew before, but it was really, really obvious that people really care about this. And I was really pleased to have the borough commander with us. So let me tell you what we've done since that public meeting to now and what is what we plan uh, for the coming weeks. So between then and now, our senior officers from Community Safety, under the leadership of um, NECA, a cabinet member, and the police working with the borough commander and the officers have worked up a, a very uh, good plan for tackling um, tackling antisocial behaviour and serious violence in the borough. Uh, I reviewed that plan yesterday with the borough commander. Uh, we, were, we looked at it and it has much detail and we would like to be able to share that really with residents over the coming weeks. It has to be a working document. It has to have some targets, things that we can measure. But most importantly, it has to be a partnership approach. There's nothing we can do as a local authority alone. And there's, the police absolutely recognise that they're on the end of dealing with the issues. Um, and also, I'm having very frank conversations about police numbers. You know, crime is a policing matter. And if you lose 400 police officers, then that I'm afraid has an impact. So when I went to see the mayor of London within the first two weeks of being elected, not only did I ask for money for youth activities, but I asked him to stick to his commitment of funding the buy one, get one free offer that we've got at the moment, where we fund 16 police officers as a council and he gives us the funding for the other. And he was very clear on that. He absolutely recognized that that was a good thing and he would continue to support that scheme. What was very apparent from the conversation, however, is the decrease in police numbers and the problem that is nationally. Yeah. And every time I speak to the borough commander, um, she talks about the challenge of recruitment. And so I was pleased to hear that over the coming months, the Metropolitan Police are going to do a really big drive to recruit, uh, especially women yeah. to the police force. Yeah, I, mean, I quite like that, buy one and get one free. Um, but I'm, sure, I'm sure there's a better title for it. I just well, Okay, but no, keep that title. It's good. Keep it, keep it. Um, but, but look, I mean, you talked about getting more resources and getting more policemen, and I understand that people do that. But what you haven't talked about is the sort of public health model, which is about early intervention. Now, I know you work with about six different agencies. One of them is Community Barnet, and I, do, I know they do a fantastic a job in, in Barnet, in working with their communities, building from the bottom up, particularly in, in social care and so on. Um, but I mean, in terms of community safety, you talked about partnership, but yeah. the partnership means agencies working together, not just at management level, but at grassroots level, at ground level, you know, the, the, the frontline workers. And that's where partnership level working is failed for decades. And if you can crack that, you will have done something really, really effective. But what I don't understand from what you've said is whether you are actually attacking that problem, whether you're trying to crack that, whether you're trying to get that partnership working down at the frontline level workers that works with the health authority, the police, the local authority, the voluntary sector, sector and communities and so on. And I'd love to hear what your plans are about that because that's what's important. So you're talking about the pre pre preventative stuff, the stuff that we do now so that in 10 years time, a, it doesn't, it doesn't cost us more in terms of money 
or in terms of the negative social impact. So the mentoring stuff is incredibly important. We've already targeted some of the money that we've got into increasing the number of mentors that we've got in the borough. When we speak to head teachers, including you know primary school teachers too, they tell us that the mentoring work that used to exist was incredibly important. So we have already identified some money to target, to recruit more mentors um, for our um, for, to support some of our schools and those that we identify, those younger people that we have identified are at most risk. And so that is some of the preventative work. But, you know, all of this costs money and the government needs to put its money where its mouth is. We are seeking money. I will, there is no door I won't knock on to get more funding, whether it's the Mayor of London, the Secretary of State or anybody else. That's why I think the work that the voluntary sector does in Enfield is absolutely crucial because without them, some of the infrastructure, social infrastructure would be far worse off. So where we can, we will put bids in and we will get that money and we'll target it to those most in need, those individuals that we think are mo most likely to be susceptible to getting involved in gangs, for example. But we have to have a serious approach to funding of youth activities, of um, children's services um, and also proper funding for our schools and we know through speaking to head teachers that you know their money is really really tight too. I know funding is a problem but the person who, who pioneered the Glasgow approach uh, uh, Karen she has said gain and again it is not an expensive approach it, you get more for less you, you, you actually by you know spending small, small amounts of money you save a lot of money in the future and you also reduce crime which they've done you through the violent reduction units um, I think they developed their approach from Boston in the United States of America and and so I mean you can go on complaining about lack of funding but you have to concentrate on building in the community in that public health model, model like they have in Glasgow. Absolute decimation of the funding and our voluntary sector organisations will tell you too that if you take out the funding that they have had it really hinders them. You're absolutely right about the Glasgow model which is why I was really pleased that the cabinet member went to Glasgow to learn from there. I was also really delighted to um, attend a, a major summit with the Mayor of London, the Metropolitan Police and representatives from those who had been involved in the Glasgow model. And in fact, NECA has already taken some learning and fed in to that action plan that I spoke about earlier. But what are we doing? Well, actually, we know that that targeted approach absolutely works. And so the little money that we have will be put into mentoring schemes, will be put into youth activities that will attract those who are most susceptible to getting involved in gangs and crime. County lines is a really big issue in Enfield really big issue and we need both you know the local authority to be doing things to make sure we hinder ind young people from getting involved in those in those gangs but we also need the police to step up and to deal with the drug barons that are leading this yeah. and we need a tough policing appro approach not for the for those on the lowest pecking order but those right at the top, because if we can do that, if the police can do that, and we can build from the grassroots of support through the mentoring and the support to schools and, you know, giving communities a sense of hope, then both the top approach and bottom approach, it means that we can tackle this. Well, I think we all look forward to see what you come up with then, especially now since the mayor is, is adopting that approach and it looks like the Home Secretary is going to make a speech about it at the Conservative yeah. Party conference. So <laughs> if Enfield comes on board with that, right, we're all in harmony. Absolutely. And he, and he, and he's, I think it was last week he announced the £1 million fund to tackling That's right. the violence. So yeah. there is an absolute recognition but you know, if your cake is this big and government makes your cake this thick in terms of funding, the Home Secretary can talk of all she likes about her commitment, but I'd like to see the funding for it too. The Home Secretary is now a man, by the way. Well, he, him too. I was thinking of the Prime <laughs> who used to be Home Secretary and who was responsible. Okay, for yeah, she's, she's, prime, she's, prime, she's Prime Minister now, though. <laughs> she's Prime Minister and has overall, yeah. overall control of the budget, so... Oh, okay, okay, I just wanted to get it. I mean, I didn't want you to call, I didn't want you to call the Home Secretary a woman when he's not, but anyway, that's another thing. And that's where um, that 
Man. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But all right. So, so I mean, yeah, let's move on. With that. By the way, I mean, we're, we're having a House of Commons meeting in October the seventeenth yeah. with the uh, with the head of the Violent Reduction Unit of Scotland coming yeah. down, and Sheldon Thomas from Gangs Line, and he was an ex gang leader who does work about developing yeah. mentors and so on. So, you know, we, we feel strongly about that. But, but the, the public. Yes. Health... By the way, it looks. Sorry, like... go on. Yeah. Sorry, I interrupted you. Go on. I was saying it looks like a very good event, um, you know, so I didn't, I'm sorry I'm unable to join, but it looks like a great event and I'd really look forward to hearing the outcomes of those discussions. Yeah. It's already sold out, so it's obviously very popular. Um, not sold out, but it's full. We didn't charge. All right, let's go to, let's go to social care um, and so on. I mean, lots of people think that social care and, and community care also should have a bottom-up approach. Some people call, talk about asset-based community development, for example, where you look at the strengths of community and build on it. And I know somebody called Cormac Russell has been pushing that, working with Croydon and doing that. And your own head of um, director of public health, has talked about health in all practice, HIP, HIP which is uh, the World Health Organization uh, scheme that, that they're promoting, where they're trying to build social capital in the community, build community resilience. Um, and in terms of developing social care and health, I mean, no government has been able to crack it. It's such a huge problem. They know it has to be a partnership, and they know the community has had, uh, must have an important part to play. Communities, for example, can uh, also... Um, you know, help with problems like loneliness if you, if you have the right system developing. Now, have you thought through that in the sense that how can you build the community to help you deal with the problems of social care and community care? You can't do any of these things if your public finances are being decimated. And there's a reality to all of this. I said earlier we lost 60% of our funding and in the next couple of weeks my cabinet have got to find 20 million just for this year so yes all of those things are incredibly important and building strong communities and resilience is incredibly important and you can never have transformation or redesign of services that matter if you don't have the funding to support it so i think if you're going to champion those things then you have to be committed to funding them too and that's the challenge we are in at Enfield because we are committed to the, all of that, but our, the money that we're given by government is just a pittance. So if you take adult social care, for example, you're totally right. Um, integration will be the future of being able to, to provide sustainable adult social care um, services, both that the local authority will provide, but also the NHS too. But you know, over the last couple of years, it's been very difficult for the local authority to do transformative stuff, to be able to remodel what they provide, to be able to have that bottom-up approach, because any money that they've had has been about, you know, firefighting, to be honest with you. Demand has gone through the roof, and that's what they've been needing to focus on. Now, the local authority has done some really innovative stuff, like set up um, IWE, but until we get proper funding, not just for local authorities, but for the NHS too, until there is adequate primary care in this borough, I'm afraid, you know, all the things that people want to see will be very, very difficult to achieve because we just don't have the money for it. And that, I'm afraid, is the responsibility of central government. OK, I, I understand that. And, you know, one can complain about the lack of funding, quite rightly. But if you're a local authority, you still have to deliver services given what you have. And you have to develop a plan around what you have. You can complain that you don't have enough but you need to deliver a plan around what you've got. And there is a lot you can do. I mean, I was talking to Community Barnet the other day, and they have a really active uh, clinical commissions group, and a lot of their doctors are offering social prescriptions. You know, don't prescribe medicine. They actually get their patients and link them with groups, help them with um, self-help, help them with loneliness by linking them with groups. And the social prescription model is being used right across the country in num a number of areas, in pilot areas. 
And I gather it's quite weak in Enfield, and that's something we could build up. You could build up through the Health and Wellbeing Board by talking to the health bodies about trying to develop social prescription. That can be done without a lot of extra cash. Okay, let's complain about we don't have cash, but do positive things as well. Well, and we should we should do that as a local authority. The reality is that you know the restructuring of the NHS, the fragmenting of it, has, the creation of CCGs, for example, you know. I don't understand why government doesn't recognise that the best way, the best way to shape services, health services, is with the local community. And councils are best placed to do that. The CCGs are separate to local authority control. Yes, we have the Health and Wellbeing Board and we have good representation on there and we'll work in partnership. But ultimately, that commissioning lies with the CCG. And we have very little control over what they do. We can try and influence, but they are a separate entity. And I think there is great room for improvement. And let me just say about the social prescribing. It is a fantastic idea. And yes, there are great things that we can do in terms of innovation in the NHS. I work for NHS England, you know, I'm really proud to work. Wow. <laughs> but ultimately, ultimately, it is about money. And it matters if your waiting lists are going up and you are having to wait twice as long to be seen you know, because of your, the pain in your hip or the lump that you found in your breast or the lack of access that you have for mental health services. That is about resourcing. And I have to say, as we're talking about health, I am concerned to hear um, murmurings around North Middlesex Hospital being taken over by the Royal Free. We know that the Royal Free is in a difficult financial position. We've been here before with Chase Farm Hospital um, and there is a case for change that um, they're looking at at the moment. And I really would encourage everybody to work through the Health and Wellbeing um, uh, Board, but also Health Watch Enfield to make their voice heard um, about why we need North Middlesex Hospital. Okay, no, that, that, that's fine. But I think all I'm saying is that I understand the case about funding, but local authorities can do a lot, whatever the situation is. They can be very innovative. And I think what, we're, what all of us are interested in finding out is what innovative things you're doing, what new things you're doing within the resources you've got. Because out of, you know, difficulties, great things can happen. And I hope that does happen. So, you know... A good example is IWE that was set up. Um, because as a local authority, we can't directly commission, uh, well, we can't provide um, adult social care ourselves. So the company that we've set up is, it, it, is, is able to provide that care, commission that care um, that our most vulnerable adults in the borough need. And it's doing really, really well. Um, the model has just, you know, it's been there for a couple of years now. It's moving into the second phase. Um, it is providing... Uh, a service that otherwise the sector wouldn't be able to, a need that the sector wouldn't be able to meet. So there are things that local authorities are doing. And, you know, the, the fact that Enfield Council recognised that we were limited in terms of um, the funds that were given and the legislation too, they thought outside the box and they've set up IWE and it is already a great success. Um, but there are there are other things that we will need to look at because the challenge, as you rightly recognise, is if the NHS uh, is in, is under so much pressure, then actually it's really important that we do what we can as a local authority to, for example, prevent elderly people, um, you know. Uh, being stuck in hospital when really they could be in their own home and making sure they have the support to stay in their home for as long as possible not only saves the NHS more money in the long run but is actually better for that individual their health and well-being is far better yeah. and actually as a authority we quite we do well at that yeah yeah okay no I, I'm, sure, I'm sure you do and I think you know working with the CCGs which you can work with CCGs and the health and well-being board you can develop a lot of things that way and I know a lot of local authorities have worked with CCGs and developing social prescription for example but let me go on to a couple of other things because I know it's Saturday and I know you need to get off to your family and that's really important too but I mean one of the things is that you know if you're going to involve the community in the public health model in all sorts of ways and, and you want to engage your community you've got to be accountable and some people aren't quite sure 
who is responsible for what in your count in your council i mean you've got cabinet leads but i gather you keep shifting little things from one area to the other from one cabinet lead to the other so we don't quite know who is in charge of what when will you have an organizational chart so that we in this civil society know exactly who is accountable for what on the website it has been since the end of may uh, when we had our annual general meeting uh, at the council it's a full democratic meeting um, and uh, the cabinet not only were the titles agreed to them but so were the portfolio positions and it has to be published and so it was at the end of may um, i'm very happy to send you the link that might be helpful yeah. but i think look i think at the heart of the question is around being able to have dialogues and shape policy and uh, shape the things that the council is providing and that's, that's, what, that's what I'm asking, actually, because I think you're right. It's important is to have dialogue. And as long as we know who to go to, you know, if it's children's service, we go to Achilles. If it's health and well-being, we go to Aleph, your mother. If it's public health, we go to Yasmin and so on and so on. So long as we know that and we know who we can You know, talk the cabinet, to, the okay. cabinet um, is collective responsibility and we must all play our part in that. So, for example, on Meridian Water, the reason why we have... Uh, under my portfolio is because it, it has to be a collective decision making and of course there are portfolio areas and that's really important and any member of the public because ultimately we are Labour councillors and people have opinions on everything um, so you know you should be able to contact anyone but I mean this idea that things are swapped around I don't think is quite accurate like I said, it was published at the end of May and it's on the, it's on the website. But can I, can I just say something about communication? So I'm really in favour of the council doing, you know, I think it's fantastic that you do a webinar, for example, but I'd really be up for the council doing more of that. Um, I think it's really important that not just me, but cabinet members and, all, and other councillors do roadshows across the borough. You know, we must go into schools and speak to people about the issues that matter to them. We have to, for example, see our public galleries full when we have those full council meetings and they should also be full when there are scrutiny committee meetings too and so there's something about making sure that the way that the council runs is more accessible yeah, I, agree. Um, I, I, I agree with that and I'm, I'm glad you're saying that and that you know I'm, we hope to do some road shows as well and we want to work, work with all the other social networks and I'm glad you 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 said everyone should be available so you're quite happy are you for us and other people in civil society to look upon councillors as leaders in their community and we can contact whoever we want and we can then talk to them either face to face in a meeting on a webinar and you would put no restriction in that you think that that is a part of open transparent democratic engagement why would i <laughs> why would i and from the number of emails i get on a daily basis from people contacting me i think people you know have demonstrated already they're confident that's what the administration is about look i ran I ran because I wanted to drive the administration forward. And I think Enfield is on the cusp of something really exciting. We haven't, for example, spoken about town centre regeneration, Enfield Town, Edmonton Green. Um, but you know, we, if we get things right in the next couple of years, we could really transform Enfield for the better and build on some of its successes. But Enfield is nothing without its people. The place is nothing without the people. And unless we shape things with people at the heart of it, uh, we won't, we won't, we won't succeed. So um, the number of emails I have in my inbox is illustrative of that. I think the number of interviews that I've conducted over the last few months is illustrative of that. And, you know, I think generally the interest that Enfield Council has had, uh, which has been really positive. I mean, it has been overwhelming the number of young girls from schools who have emailed me to say, it's great that you've stood and your leader. Uh, the number of people from BME backgrounds, you know, uh, I had lots of different communities contact me to say, this is something that is really significant to us. I had underestimated the impact of that, how positive that would be, and I'm, I'm really grateful for their recognition. Okay, well, I'm sure there was a lot we could talk about. Um, some of the things you mentioned, but we said this would only be an hour. We could have made it too, but yeah. then you, you would have lost your family over, over the weekend. Um, so I'm, I'm going to thank you for doing that. And we look forward to uh, the sort of type of engagement you have. And 
talking to Joanne yesterday, she said she's willing to do these, you know, again, and I hope you will be as well, because I think working with the social networks that exist, um, which are independent and it's very important, it's not just a council based one that you work with independent autonomous groups within civil society as well. Yeah. And if you do that, I think, yes, we're into exciting future. So I hope well, and you're absolutely right, which is why, you know, over the last few weeks, um, you know, new print, new, new newspapers have been set up, for example, I've been very keen to say, no, you do have access to me as much as the old guard too. So, and that's really important to me. And, um, and, and we've done that and we'll just, we'll continue to do that as an administration. Okay, so we'll keep in contact with the old guard and the young guard, very young guard by my age anyhow. So I think you're doing a, you know, you're doing a good job and you're obviously thinking through the issues. So thank you for doing this and I hope we do it again. I mean, we won't do it too often because I know you're busy, but it'd be great to do this again and disseminate it across all the social networks as much as we can. I know that Joanne's uh, webinar yesterday has already got over a thousand viewings, viewings, so I'm sure this will as well. So thanks for doing this. Um, Nez, and I'll let you get on now with uh, the rest of your weekend. But it's been great to meeting you again. Despite the technical difficulties, we managed to get through it. You know, they say it's not how the party begins, it's how it ends. So it's ended very well. So thanks very much. <laughs>